And it's so nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, if everyone can just like start introducing yourselves in the chat, letting us know where you're joining us from. And also if you're here at an Initiate Justice monthly meeting for the very first time, we'd love to know who you are and how you learned about us. So if you could just share in the chat, like what brought you here tonight or where you heard of and learned of our monthly meeting, we'd love to get connected with you all. Hey, Roxy, so nice to see you here. Amazing. Um, also a couple of other things around housekeeping. Because the call is being recorded, we do ask if you could stay muted um, while folks are speaking. If you have like questions or things, please feel free to drop that into the chat um, because we want to make sure that the recording does capture um, all of our speakers. We do have some exciting guests joining us tonight. So in a moment, once we have folks all joined and settled in, I'll sort of go through the agenda and then get us started. Um, but love to see folks joining us from all over California, from the Bay Area, along with Orange County, Inland Empire. So thank you all for joining us. I also want to be mindful of everyone's time. So I'll go ahead and just like briefly introduce like myself, share the agenda, um, and then I'll also create just a brief moment for um, a couple of our co-hosts that, that are supporting me today to just introduce their name and their role with Initiate Justice real quick. So for those who might be joining us for the very first time. Um, so our agenda tonight, again, we have some exciting guests. So first we'll start with some general organizational updates. You'll hear from a couple of people on the team. Um, and then what we will do is we'll share what upcoming meetings we have here at Initiate Justice. And then we will pass it over to our guests for the evening. Our topic today is going to be California state budget. And so we have some awesome speakers from the California Budget and Policy Center joining us this evening. And we will be passing it over to them um, in just a couple of moments after going over some organizational updates. But before we jump in, I know that I also have um, Crystal and Sarah co-hosting with me today and then Michelle supporting um, as well. So my name is Antoinette Ratcliffe. I am the executive director with Initiate Justice. Super elated to be here again in space with all of you in community. Um, and I'll pass it over to like Crystal, Sarah and Michelle to also briefly introduce themselves. Thank you, Antoinette. Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal, pronoun she, her, and I am the Insider Membership Manager with Initiate Justice. Um, I'll pass to you, Sarah. Thanks, Crystal. Hi, all. I'm Sarah Rigney. I am the Policy Analyst here at Initiate Justice and excited to be here with everyone. I'll pass to Michelle. Thank you. Crystal beat me to the unmute button. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Cardenas. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Communications Manager here at Initiate Justice. And I'll pass it back to you, Antoinette. Thank you so much. So real quick, I did see in the chat that there might be one or two or a couple of people who are joining us here at Initiate Justice for the very first time. Um, so just providing like a brief overview of the organization. Um, our mission here at Initiate Justice is to activate the political power of people who are directly impacted by incarceration in efforts to end mass incarceration and abolish prisons here in the state of California. We unite the insights and the efforts of impacted people both inside and outside of prisons. That includes people like myself um, and some of our staff members here who have loved ones currently or formerly incarcerated along with people who are currently and formerly incarcerated. Our entire team, as well as our board of directors are all folks who are impacted by incarceration. And so we truly embody and believe that those who are closest to the issue do have the intimate knowledge to bring forth the solutions that we need for lasting change. So that's just like a very brief overview of Initiate Justice. I'll jump into some of our organizational updates um, and then pass it to some folks on the team to also share some additional updates. So I talked about uniting the efforts of people inside and outside of prison. So here on Initiate Justice, we have an inside outside organizing strategy through which we train advocates both inside of state prisons and impacted people outside of state prisons all throughout California 
on community organizing, on policy advocacy, and really understanding the legislative process and how we can be engaged and amplify our voices and experiences in order to achieve policy change. And so one of those programs is our Institute of Impacted Leaders. And last month, we shared that we had just graduated organizers out of the Inland Empire area. This month, I'm sharing that starting tomorrow, our 17th cohort of the Institute of Impacted Leaders is starting. And so we will be organizing alongside folks in the Bay Area. So we have participants from Contra Costa County, 25 new participants who for the next 12 weeks will be going through our Institute of Impacted Leaders cohort, learning advocacy and organizing from our amazing facilitators, Adriana, our statewide advocacy manager, and Graham, one of our Initiate Justice Outside organizers. So if you are impacted by incarceration, interested in learning how you too can gain some additional knowledge and grow your toolbox to be an effective advocate for policy change, then you can learn more on our website at initiatejustice.org slash Institute of Impacted Leaders. Collectively, our Institute of Impacted Leaders and our Inside Organizing Program has trained over 650 advocates throughout California, inside and outside of prison. So super amazing. Thank you for all the organizers here who have gone through the program and thank you all for continuing to share it with your loved ones and your community as well. And I'm going to actually pass it over to Crystal to share about our Inside Membership Program and some updates. Thank you so much, Antoinette. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Crystal. I am the Inside Membership Manager with Initiate Justice. In addition to the 600 plus organizers, we also have about 45,000 incarcerated members throughout California state prisons. Um, and my primary update today is that the 2023 Art Gallery, where we featured six incarcerated artists, la launched last month on July 8th. Um, the launch event was an inspirational and empowering event. And now the 2023 Art Gallery, beautiful website created by our communications manager, Michelle, and shop are now live. Uh, so I am going to drop, or my colleagues are going to drop a link in the chat for the website. On there, you can find the artwork from the six featured artists, along with audio recordings of them telling their stories. Um, so I encourage you all to go listen to their stories, um, a gentle content warning, of course. And I am leaving you all tonight with a call to action, which is to leave a message to the artists. After you look at their artwork, listen to their stories, leave them a message. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to print those out and mail it, mail it to them on the inside. Um, thank you to all of the community members who have been sharing the gallery, who already wrote a message. We really appreciate it. And again, thank you to the six incarcerated artists and their loved ones um, for their beautiful donation to initiate justice. Thank you, Antonella. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Crystal. Really appreciate it. And then um, also make sure that you follow us on Instagram as well. You can see some um, photos, footage, and more information on the art gallery there as well. And I will be passing it now to our policy analyst, Sarah, to let us know where our bills are and where are we with the legislature right now. Thanks so much, Antoinette. I'll give some brief overviews tonight, but if you are interested to learn more, you'll hear in a couple moments that we have our volunteer uh, community option committee will be focused on policy. So you will be able to hear more from me and Greg, who lead all of our co-sponsored legislation through the legislative process, exactly what's going on with each bill and what needs to be done. What does it mean when we say suspense file appropriations committee? And what are, the, what are the final hurdles that we need to get to to have these bills become law? It's really exciting that we still have six pieces of legislation moving through the process. Almost all of them with the exception of AB 1118, the Racial Justice Act 3.0, which is eligible for a Senate floor vote and the ACA by assembly member, assembly member Brian, which is our Voting Rights in Prison, Free the Vote Act, uh, which is pending an assembly, member, assembly floor vote. All other bills have already passed through their first houses, 
and are waiting in appropriations. So the legislature is on summer recess right now, so not much will be happening over the next few weeks, but we come back in two weeks, I think, or almost two weeks from today on the 14th, and then we'll start seeing some movement. So we'll start seeing immediately some movement in the appropriations committee. We'll have a big hearing at the end of the month called the suspense file hearing, which you can learn more about if you join our committee uh, next week. And with that, I will pass back to you, Antoinette. Thank you so much, Sarah. Really appreciate those updates. I highly encourage you all to join um, our volunteer committee next week on Wednesday at 5.30. I dropped the link into the chat and also wanting to share for those who are curious, who maybe are not yet familiar with our legislation, on our website, you can actually take a look at our current bills that are going through the legislature. And if you are absolutely new here to initiate justice to this space, you can also take a look at some of our previous legislation. And that is also on our website. And so I wanted to plug those links for you all as well. Along with our volunteer committee, we also have another committee which is called our Community Action Committee. And so that will be hosted by our statewide advocacy manager. And thank you, Crystal, who dropped that link into the chat for us. Really appreciate you sharing that. So along with our volunteer committee, that's happening next week in a couple of weeks on August 23rd, Wednesday, August 23rd, our community action committee is meeting. And so that link was also dropped into the chat. And also, Sarah, thank you so much. Sarah just shared her email in the chat as well. For those who have policy questions, you can always reach out directly to our policy team. So thank you so much, um, team, for, for the updates. And now it's where it gets really exciting. And we have some guests here with us tonight. So before I introduce our guests, first I want to share, and again, we'll be talking about the state budget process. And so first I wanna share that last spring, Initiate Justice, we hosted uh, two monthly meetings around the state budget process as well. So in March, we were joined by Brian Canetta of CURB, one of our really powerful um, and amazing community partners. And they introduced us to budget advocacy in efforts to close prisons and transform our criminal legal system. Um, so highly encourage those of you who are, who are interested in tonight's content um, or who are just interested in learning more about the budget advocacy process to check out our YouTube video of our March 2022 monthly meeting. In addition, in April last year, we were joined by then assembly member Mark Stone, who provided us with some additional insight into the state's budget process. And that recording is also on our YouTube. And so highly encourage, highly encourage both of those as resources as you all continue to build your advocacy toolbox um, in community and also share with others in your community to build their skill set and knowledge around advocacy. And budget advocacy is essential alongside our existing policy change efforts because it's California's state budget that currently funds and fuels the massive prison system that we have here in the state of California. And so in a moment, I'm gonna pass it to the California Budget and Policy Center. But first I want to give a little bit of insight um, the California Budget and Policy Center is a California nonprofit that uses research and analysis to advance public policies that expand opportunities and promote well being for all Californians. So they understand that the state's budget and policy choices have upheld and have compounded structural racism, sexism, and other forms and other forms of systemic oppression. We have the pleasure of supporting and being featured on their empowered engagement panel at their 2023 policy insights conference in April earlier this year it was a really powerful conference in which they brought together California's policy community this included advocates organizations philanthropists public leaders abolitionists authors and they grounded us in connectedness 
We spent the day really sharing ideas, transformative ideas, and strategizing a pathway toward a more inclusive state. We discussed how we can craft anti-racist policies that center Black, Brown, and underrepresented voices to put an end to discriminatory practices here in the state of California. Um, it was at this conference that we heard Assemblymember Phil Team talk about his firm belief that the only way, and I quote, the only way to save money in the budget is to close prisons. Um, it was also at this conference um, that we ended with Mia Birdsong explaining freedom as a collective practice and freedom as a way of being. And so really inspired by the work that the California Budget and Policy Center does, really honored to be able to partner and work alongside them and, so, and their advocates. And today we have with us Laura Pryor, and we also have Kayla Kitson. So Laura Pryor is the Senior Policy Fellow with the California Budget and Policy Center. Her work strives to center priorities most urgent for families and child care providers to contribute to an equitable early care and education system. Prior to joining the Budget Center in 2023, Laura was an associate director at Social Policy Research Associates in the Equity Education and Community Change Division, where she led multiple research and evaluation projects. Laura is a lifelong Californian. She grew up in Southern California and currently resides in the Bay Area. Outside of work, she enjoys running and biking on the Bay Area trail system, visiting new restaurants, and spending time with family. So thank you very much for joining us, Laura. And then we also have Kayla. Kayla is the senior policy analyst at the California Budget and Policy Center. The primary goal of Kayla's work is to advance policies that make the state's tax system more fair and ensure that it raises enough revenue to support the services Californians need to thrive. Before joining the California Budget and Policy Center in 2018, Kayla worked on federal tax policy issues in Washington, D.C. at Americans for Tax Fairness and the Institution on Taxation and Economic Policy. Prior to getting into tax policy work, she focused on affordable housing and homelessness at organizations right here in L.A. County and in the Bay Area. Kayla was raised in San Diego County and she enjoys watching TV with wry humor, listening to music, and occasionally camping. When she's not working or binging on TV, you might find her doing word puzzles or practicing Spanish with Duolingo or her cat. Um, so thank you, Kayla. Thank you, Laura, for joining us. Super excited. And I will pass it over to the two of you. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. And thank you all for inviting us to this space this evening. We're really excited to be here in a moment. I'll share my screen and we'll walk through our presentation for today, which will be more or less a budget process 101 to give you all a high level, but also sufficient understanding of the state budget process to hopefully support your advocacy efforts. And we'll also conclude with a few remarks on how the justice system is in the enacted 2023-24 state budget. So I will go ahead and share screens. So as noted for our presentation, our goals are as follows. So first we'll discuss key facts about the state budget process. We'll describe the state budget process, highlight the key players, the timeline, and opportunities for public involvement, and then we'll conclude by reviewing justice-related items in the enacted state budget. We'll also have time for Q&A at the end of our presentation, but please feel free to share any questions in the chat as they come up for you. So first, a few comments about just generally the importance of the state budget for all Californians. So the state budget is about more than dollars and cents. It's a statement of our values and priorities as Californians. We should always remember the human face of the state budget, that state budget choices affect all Californians. Budget choices answer the question, what kind of a California do we want to live in? 
So now we'll turn to a few key facts about the state budget. First, the state budget consists of both state funds and federal funds. So in this chart, it breaks down the funding between state funds and federal funds in the state budget. So here we see in that dark green portion of the chart that over half of expenditures come from what we call the general fund, which are accounts for state revenues that are not designated for a specific purpose. The other major source of state funding comes from special funds. California has more than 500 special funds, all with dollars designated for specific purposes. Examples of special funds include a mattress recycling fund, a toxic cleanup fund, and a state parks fund, which is funded from parking fees. Spending from state bonds funds comes in at just under 3 billion, which puts state spending at just over two thirds of the pie. So the green shades that you're seeing on this graph, all on this chart, all represent the state funding portion. And that remaining 31% of expenditures, that blue portion, are funded through federal funds. So the state budget is designed to provide funding to communities across the state. So we can think of the state budget as actually a local budget with dollars going out across the state. So how are these dollars spent? Well, most spending through the state budget goes out to people and organizations through a category called local assistance, which is what you see here in the blue portion of this graph. So this includes, for example, funding for K-12 schools and funding for doctors who treat patients through the Medi-Cal program. Even the category called state operations, which you see in orange, sends a lot of money out across the state. Recipients of state operations funding include, for example, the CSU and the UC systems, as well as state prisons. So the remaining funds are provided for infrastructure projects as capital outlay, which you see that small yellow bar in the chart. Again, these dollars filter down to the local level. So as hinted at in the previous chart, state spending supports a wide range of public systems and services. So for example, as you see in this chart, health and human services represents more than one third of state spending, followed by K-12 education, which accounts for over one fourth of state spending and higher education, which accounts for around 8% of state spending. It's also important to know that the state budget is what we call, is, is part of what's called a budget package. So this budget package includes both what's called a budget bill and budgets related to trailer bills. So each year's budget package is typically massive. So let's start with the budget bills. What are they? So budget bills provide appropriations. In other words, they say how funds will be spent. These budget bills move through budget committees until they are eventually passed as what's called the Budget Act, which is the enacted budget bill. So here's the Legislative Council summary of this year's Budget Act, which is the, the boxed portion on this slide, which was passed by the legislator and signed into law last June. So SB 101 or Senate Bill 101 is the Budget Act of 2023. This summary or digest appears at the outset of the bill and the bill itself is nearly 900 pages long. So in addition to the Budget Act, as mentioned, the whole budget package also includes what's called trailer bills. Trailer bills also generally make changes to state law related to the budget. So put differently, trailer bills generally make what's called statutory changes needed to implement the policies assumed in the budget. So I say generally make statutory changes to, re to related to the budget bill for two reasons. So first, trailer bills can do things other than change state law. So a bill proposing a constitutional amendment or a general obligation bond. A trailer bill also technically does not have to relate directly to the budget bill. It can do anything the legislator wants it to do. However, they were, there will generally be at least some link to something in the budget bill. So budget related policy issues are dealt with either through the trailer bill process or through direct budget bill language. So budget bill language goes directly into the budget bill and is effective for only one year. So that is, it's a temporary change. 
So advocates may prefer budget bill language because if the change is seen as negative, it automatically expires at the end of the fiscal year. So if the change were in the trailer bill language, then it re would remain in effect until lawmakers and the governor subsequently change state law. And the governor may also prefer issues dealt with through the budget bill language because that then allows him more control over the wording. So the governor can delete budget bill provisions, but cannot do the same with trailer bills for which he either has to accept or reject the entire trailer bill. So with that, I'll now pass to Kayla for the next part of our presentation. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, so I will talk for a little bit about the constitutional rules for, um, for the budget and the budget process. And then I'll move on to the timeline of the budget process and how you can get involved uh, in advocacy efforts throughout that process. So moving on to the next slide. Um, you can see here that there's been a handful of ballot measures dating back to the 70s that have had impacts on the rules of budgeting and the budget process. A lot of folks are probably familiar with this, this one that kicked it off in 1978, Proposition 13, which uh, drastically limited property tax, um, property tax revenues and uh, rates. <laughs> um, so then there's been a bunch of other bills that have impacted the budget process since then. And moving on to the next slide, there are a few uh, requirements that relate to budget deadlines. So the first one is that the governor has to release uh, an initial version of a proposed budget by January 10th of each year. And then the second is that the legislature has to pass a budget bill by June 15th. Now that deadline of June 15th only applies to the main budget bill. So that doesn't apply to the budget related trailer bills that Laura was talking about that implement uh, related policy changes. Another requirement is that both the, the proposed and the enacted budget must be balanced. So revenues have to at least meet or exceed proposed spending. And there's also a deadline of May 14th for the governor to release his uh, revised budget or the May revision. That is not actually a constitutional deadline. So that's written into state law which means that if lawmakers really wanted to, they could change that without going to voter approval. Whereas the, the January and June dates are in the constitution and only voters could change those. There's also a penalty for lawmakers if they don't pass a budget by June 15th. And that was put into place with Proposition 25 in 2010. So for each day that the lawmakers don't pass a budget after June 15th and send it to the governor, they forfeit their pay. So what this has ended up doing in some years is that the legislature will pass their version of the budget to meet that June 15th deadline before they've actually fully come to agreement with the governor on some key items. So for this year, the legislature passed the main budget bill that, that Laura showed you a snippet of, SB 101, by the June 15th deadline. But there were a few outstanding items that they hadn't uh, come to agreement with the governor on. So the governor finally signed that budget bill along with the first of probably several budget bill juniors, which amend that initial budget bill. And he signed those on June 27th. So just in time for the new fiscal year that starts in July, on July 1st. Um, so that it, that wasn't an unusual thing that's happened in, in prior years where the first budget bill comes out and then some of the, the final details get worked out behind the scenes before the, the new fiscal year starts. Um, moving on to the next slide, there are other requirements in the Constitution that relate to vote thresholds for different types of bills. So the budget bill and most budget uh, trailer bills can be passed by a simple majority vote, so just over 50%. Before Proposition 25 of 2010, a two-thirds vote was required to pass the budget, and that can be a difficult threshold to get to. So before that proposition, there were a lot of late budgets. <clears throat> and that was also before that that same proposition added the requirement that they pass a budget on time or they or lawmakers start losing their pay. Um, so budget related trailer bills, like I said, can generally be passed by a majority vote and they take effect as soon as they're signed, as long as the main budget bill refers to that trailer bill as a budget related bill. 
and as long as they have some kind of some amount of spending in them. Now, this is different than policy bills that don't go through the budget process. So we heard earlier about some of the, the bills that you all are sponsoring that go through a different process than budget related bills. Um, and those types of bills generally don't take effect until January 1st of the fall of the, the upcoming year, unless they contain an urgency clause and they're passed with a two thirds vote in the legislature. And moving on to the next slide. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> um, so speaking of two thirds votes, in order to pass tax increases, a two thirds vote of both the Senate and the assembly is required. Now this requirement for a two thirds vote for tax increases has been in the constitution since Prop 13 in 1978, but Prop 13 only required that two thirds vote uh, if the tax changes raised revenues for the state overall. So a bill that just changed the distribution of taxes, increasing some taxes while cutting others um, and not having a, a positive impact on revenues could be passed by a majority vote. But in 2010, Proposition 26 was passed and now the two thirds vote requirement is even more restrictive. So any bill that raises uh, taxes on any taxpayer is subject to a two thirds vote, even if there's no net cost to the state. So what this means is that it's actually really rare for measures that raise new revenues to, to expand existing programs or create new programs to actually be approved in the legislature. Even when one party has a super, super majority in the legislature, it's still hard to get a two thirds vote on taxes. Um, this is probably more than you wanna know about taxes, but this is my area, so I have to harp on it a little bit. Um, so a lot of me members of the legislature are hesitant to take votes to raise taxes. Um, even if they're done in progressive ways. Uh, and so often committee chairs or legislative leaders might not even put those types of measures, measures up for a vote uh, so that their members don't have to go on record taking those votes. And finally, with the next slide, we'll finish up the, the constitutional framework. Another really important thing is that the state constitution has these three formulas that dictate how a really pretty large shares of the state budget is spent. So many folks are probably familiar with Proposition 98, which guarantees uh, a, a minimum funding level for K through 12 schools and community colleges. That gen generally results in about 40% of general fund revenues going into K through 14 education. On top of that, there's Proposition 2, which requires that some revenues be put into um, a budget reserve to, to save for, to have a buffer for when there are future bu budget problems and to pay down existing debts. And then finally, there's Prop 4, which is also known as the GAN limit or the state appropriations limit, which can in some years require revenues to be spent in a certain way if they exceed uh, a certain threshold that I won't go into all the nitty gritty on. But long story short, when you combine all of those requirements, it just means that a substantial share of the budget is already spoken for in any given year. Okay, so now we can move on to the next slide. Uh, we'll get into who the key players are in the budget process, what the timeline is, and where the, what points the advocates can get involved in the process and make their voices heard. So these are the some of the key players. <laughs> of course, we have the governor, Gavin Newsom. Then we have the, the leaders of the state senate and the state assembly. So Tony Atkins is the Senate president pro tem. And we have a new speaker of the assembly, Robert Rivas, who recently took over from Anthony Rendon. So these three are can be known as the big three for the budget uh, since they play pretty critical roles in the budget negotiations. But we don't wanna leave out the public because members of the public have ways to make their voices heard throughout the process. Um, so moving on to the next slide, the governor really does have the lead role in crafting the budget. And that's because we have an executive centered budget system. If you move on to the next slide, um, these are <laughs> pretty old pictures now, but so the governor always sets that puts out the first version of the budget in January, like we talked about earlier. So that allows him to have the first word in the budget del deliberations. That initial proposed budget will show spending for the current and prior years, as well as proposed spending for the upcoming state fiscal year. Uh, and again, the, the state fiscal year runs from July 1st through June 30th. 
Uh, so at the same time as they put out the, the detailed budget, they will also put out a governor's budget summary document, which is kind of a plain language document that uh, goes through the, the governor's economic and revenue outlook. We'll talk about uh, major proposed policy initiatives and talk about some key spending items. Um, and then in May of each year, the governor will put out the May revise, which will revise the, the economic and revenue outlooks. And then based on those revisions, we'll potentially revise um, levels of spending proposed or add to or withdraw policy initiatives from a base compared to what was proposed in January. And then finally, the governor does have the ability to veto bills in the budget bill, uh, package that were passed by the legislature. And he can veto um, individual lines of appropriation for you know, certain spending items. So that really does give the governor a lot of leverage over this process, because in order to override a veto, uh, the both houses of the legislature would have to pass, pass it with a two thirds vote. So moving on to the next slide, even though the governor plays the primary role, the legislature also plays a really important role. So after the governor puts out his version of the proposed budget in January, the legislature is going to start holding hearings to review those proposals, and they can then accept, revise, or reject those proposals. They can also add their new proposals in line with their own priorities. Um, <clears throat> and so the Legislative Analyst Office is also an important, uh, important entity here because they provide assistance to the legislature, uh, producing analyses on various proposals and then making recommendations. Next slide. So here are some other key players. These are the chairs of the budget committees in both the Senate and the Assembly. You have Nancy Skinner in the Senate and Phil Ting um, in the, the Assembly. And uh, we can certainly make these slides available afterwards. Um, and there's also Gabriel Pettick, who leads the Legislative Analyst Office. And as I just mentioned, he leads a team of analysts who will provide analyses on budget proposals and make recommendations to the legislature. Um, so each, the Senate and the Assembly budget committees all start holding hearings in beginning around no, uh, February after the pr proposed budget is released. And the subcommittees will hold, hold hearings to uh, cover different topics. So each budget subcommittee has five or six subcommittees that focus on different uh, broadly defined issue areas. So for justice system issues, you'd wanna follow subcommittee five in both the Senate and the Assembly, because they focus on uh, corrections, public safety, and the judiciary among other things. So, Again, move on to the next slide. Members of public do have ways to make their voices heard, um, and there are ways to advocate for or against proposals in the budget. So on the next slide, you can see some of the, the opportunities to do that. You can always submit written testimony. Um, so you can find details on the Assembly and, and Senate Budget Committee websites, which are listed here. And again, we'll make these slides. We'll make sure you all have these slides. Um, you can also, if you're able, if you're in Sacramento or you can make it to Sac Sacramento, you can attend a hearing in person and provide public comment. Uh, you should be able to find details in hearing agendas uh, on the Assembly and Senate Budget Committee websites. And then there, sometimes there might be options to call in to provide public comment. This option was really widely avail available earlier in the pandemic, but I believe this year the assembly started tightening up those rules again. So some types of comment had to be in person. So next year when the budget process starts again, it would be important to, to check out the, the committee websites and look for information on the hearing agendas to see what types of public comment are allowed. Um, so next slide, it's really important to note that having a real influence on budget decisions does require relationship building uh, with policymakers and their staff. So anyone has the ability to reach out to their, uh, their policymakers. You can look at the, the websites of members, of committees, and find out what staff 
are responsible for some certain issues and just try to get a, a, a meeting on their agenda. Um, you can also reach out to folks in the governor's administration, the Department of Finance, state agencies to also um, get on their radar and build relationships there. Uh, next slide. So I'll go into a, a recap of the timeline throughout the, the budget throughout the year, but it's important to note that it is a cyclical process. So there are decisions being made throughout the year. That means that there's op opportunities for advocacy throughout the year that just looks different during different periods of the year. So real quick, we'll look at the next slide, which you probably won't be able to see very well. Um, this is an uh, infographic that you can find on our website, calbudgetcenter.org, uh, that just outlines the, the process, um, what, what's going on throughout the year on the budget. Um, so we, won't, we don't, won't try to zero in on anything right now, but then we'll move on to the next slide and first just talk again about the January through June period, which we've talked about a lot here. Um, so that this first half of the calendar year is really where there's a lot of movement and a lot of public facing uh, stuff going on with the budget. So again, January, the governor proposes the initial budget. Um, then the legislature is gonna be holding hearings on those proposals, May revision drops mid-May. And then there's this really tight time period between the May revision and when the legislature has to pass their budget bill by June 15th. So things are moving really fast in that period. There are usually some hearings, but there's also a lot of negotiations going on behind the scenes here. Um, and it does come down to the, the big three players, so the governor and the, the leaders of the Senate and the Assembly, to figure out what the final outlines of the package are going to be if there are sticking points. So again, this period from January through June is really more public facing, and there are opportunities to directly react to the governor's proposals and to, to testify or provide written comment uh, for budget hearings. Moving on to the July through December period, which we're now in, um, the budget for the current year is mostly wrapped, although there likely will be additional trailer bills and budget bill juniors making tweaks here and there. Um, you know, especially if, if revenues come in different than was anticipated, there might have to be changes. Um, but now the governor's administration, the Department of Finance are starting to look forward to the next fiscal year. So they're starting to work on the proposal that the governor will put out in January for the 24-25 fiscal year. So in this time, if you have relationships with people in the administration or folks in the legislature, it's a good time to start trying to get your priorities into the, the governor's budget or um, folk, talk with folks in the legislature to try to get priorities into their uh, kind of broad budget blueprints that they usually put out towards the end of the, the calendar year before the budget, the governor's budget proposal drops. Um, if you don't have relationships yet, this is a good time to start trying to build those relationships. You can, um, again, try to, try to get your priorities in, in the legislative version of the, the budget blueprint or suggest hearings that the legislator, uh, the legislature might hold. So with that, that, that concludes the process piece of it. And then I'm gonna pass it back to Laura to talk about some key takeaways um, from the budget for that was just enacted for 2324 uh, in the areas of, of corrections and public safety that you might be interested in. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you for that really helpful overview of the overall process. So as Kayla mentioned, I'll now take a moment to share key items in the 2023-24 budget related to state corrections and local public safety. So in other words, after that whole process that Kayla just went through for this upcoming fiscal year, this is what we're seeing with regards to state corrections and local public safety. So regarding corrections, the enacted budget continues plans to downsize the state's prison system. So the budget addresses prison closures by declaring an intent to shut down additional prisons. 
So this is accompanied by a requirement from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation to assess the state prison system's capacity and needs and report back to the legislator during 2023. So this report should provide a foundation to understand where opportunities lie in closing more state prisons. However, according to a report by the Legislative Analyst Office, the state can safely close up to five additional prisons, saving the state around $1 billion per year. These savings could be used to provide services and supports for individuals after they, after they are released from prison. Additionally, the enacted budget includes $361 million from the Public Buildings Construction Fund to build an educational and vocational center at San Quentin State Prison, which will be renamed the San Quentin Rehabilitation Center. The enacted budget also includes almost $600 million in 2003-2024 for the Medi-Cal Providing Access and Transforming Health Initiative which provides pre-release care and coordination with justice agencies. So with regards to public safety, the enacted budget funds a variety of public safety measures that are designed to improve the safety of all Californians. So this includes an additional 12 million to assist tribal police and prosecutors in cases of missing murdered indigenous persons, 20 million in one-time funding to enhance security at nonprofits, that are at risk of hate-motivated violence, restoring $40 million in one-time funding for the third year of a three-year public defense pilot program. So this allocates funding to counties to provide public defenders for those who cannot afford legal services. The budget also restructures a gun buyback program in order to move more quickly to address mass shootings. And lastly, the budget provides $113 million for the Safe Neighborhoods and Schools Fund, which is Proposition 47 from 2014, to help reduce recidivism, support truancy and dropout prevention programs, and fund services for crime victims. This funding reflects state-level savings due to declining incarceration following the implementation of Proposition 47. So to conclude, the state budget should reflect our values and priorities as Californians. And the more information that you have about how the state budget process works will hopefully help ensure that the values and priorities of all, of all Californians are included. So thank you so much for having us at your meeting this evening. It was really a pleasure to join you and have the opportunity to share this information. Our emails are in this slide and we can also drop them in the chat. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us. But at this time, we are happy to answer any questions that you might have for us now. Thank you so much, Laura and Kayla. Really appreciate all of the information. Um, I know just like with any policy advocacy, the process is very complex. And so really appreciate you taking the time to try and break it down um, in a very easily understandable format. Um, so I, I see a lot of just thanks and gratitude being shared into the chat now, um, but wanted to also create space. I know, um, I know we have some folks here who do work in or support budget advocacy in a variety of ways, but we also might have a lot of new folks in this space. So I see Crispy has her hand raised. So I'm gonna pass it over to Crispy as we get um, some questions from our community. Thank you so much for your presentation. I, I've worked with CURB before and I've been to a lot of the sub five committee meet, meetings, which are kind of depressing <laughs> because it's usually like Ting trying to get CDCR to provide reports, which they never do, but they still get the funding anyway. So I was wondering if under the new secretary for CDCR, if things have changed because I've stopped going to those meetings because it became a waste of my time. And then the second question um, is related to uh, one of the last slides that you had where it says 40 million is going to public defense pilot program. So I know that public defenders were defunded by 50 million. Is this trying to repair that? Does this go to public defenders or is this a completely different program? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, both are really good questions. Thank you so much for asking them. Um, so your first question, just to make sure I understood correctly, is asking if the new secretary of CDCR is 
going to make any changes when it comes to the budget and policy making in the subcommittee moving forward. Um, I personally don't um, don't know off the top of my head the answer to that. Kayla, I'm wondering if you have any insight. So the the person on our staff that that tracks uh, justice system issues more closely is on vacation right now. So he may or may not have an answer to that question. I think, you know, anytime there's somebody new, it's kind of a wait and see approach. And, you know, there's also sometimes, you know, CDCR, like what agencies are doing and what the legislature are doing. Like you said, sometimes it's, they can be at odds. Um, so yeah, you know, we're happy if, if you are interested, we can connect you with our, our colleague um, who's our research director who focuses on justice system issues specifically that might have some more insight there. Um, and yeah. yeah, Laura, did you have any anything on the, the public defense? No, it, well, before program? moving to the public defense, just wanted to pause to see if anyone else in the Initiate Justice community has insight into um, Christy's first question regarding the new secretary. It is a great question. Okay, so the second question that I heard was with regards to what I mentioned around the 40 million in one-time general fund for the public defense pilot program. And in response to what Crispy mentioned around 50 million being pulled from the public defense program. Again, our colleague, our research director who is on vacation is the one that tracks these issues most closely. So I, don't want to give you any false information other than to say I'm happy to connect you all with um, with him once he's returned for more information. Unless Kayla or anyone else in the, the audience has further insight into that question. Yeah, I'd have to, to dig around. Um, I'm not really familiar with the cut. Um, it sounds like the, the 15 million that you, you were talking about is a was a cut that actually happened as opposed to, you know, so there were some things that the governor had proposed cutting in either his January budget or um, or the May revision that then the legislature preserved, but that may not be what you're referring to. So I think we'd have to do a little bit more research to get back to you on that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. Yeah, apologies, we don't have better answers for you, but we can get them and we will connect you with our research director once he's returned. Yeah, and Crispy also just dropped her email into the chat. Thank you very much, Crispy, for those questions. I know you're very active um, in a myriad of spaces around advocacy and including budget advocacy. So thank you for um, putting those questions on Kayla and Laura's radar for us. Are there any other questions, either from people who are very familiar and who are actively like working with groups around budget advocacy, or from folks who are new and, and learning about this for the first time and just have some general questions um, or want a little bit more insight on something in particular? Okay, I see a couple of hands just went up. So Melanie, um, and then after Melanie, Jane. Um, hi, everyone. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, learning the lingo online is definitely different um, <laughs> on your, by myself and having to like re go back to articles or just kind of do my own research. It's really nice to have a human interaction um, because then I can have answers and, you know, obviously questions and then answers. Um, but my only question was, what would keep a bill, my bill that I'm hoping that it passes is AB 1310. Um, I have a loved one who is serving time right now for that, um, that would greatly impact him and, and my family. Um, what would prevent that bill or any bill, um, from passing because of the, because of the financial, um, like impact it'll have in our community? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can start and then have. Kayla definitely add more detail, but there's always been um, sort of a dance between the budget process and the policy bill process. So when the former governor, Jerry Brown, was in office, we sort of knew that if a bill was over a certain amount, it was only going to 
it was only going to be attended to if it was in the budget. But with Newsom, it's less clear how much money he's willing to um, have included in a policy bill. Sometimes he'll say, you know, I'm not going to move this policy bill forward because it's too much money and it should be in the Budget Act. And that can definitely cause, you know, the policy bill to not move forward. And like I mentioned with Newsom, it's been less clear to advocates what that dollar line is, other than, you know, we know that policy bills that have very large expenditures perhaps would be less favorable for uh, the governor to move forward, uh, depending, but it, you know, there's so many factors that, that can weigh in. Um, and we know going into this next fiscal year, we are facing a deficit. So uh, there may be less of an appetite to move bills forward that have a larger price tag. Kayla, inviting you to chime in more there. Yeah, no, that was, I think that probably said better, said it better than I would have. The only thing I would add is, yeah, even, even last year when we were in a situation where we had a surplus that year, but there was like troubling signs on the horizon, Newsom did veto a lot of bills that had budget impact um, and had the same stock language in each of them, just saying like this, you know, this is, has a budget cost. We're looking at potential future downturns. So this, you know, this should be considered as part of the budget. Um, and then, so, you know, it probably varies depending on what the, what the state's fiscal situation looks like and whether the issue is something that's close to his heart or not. Um, and then even before it will get to the governor, sometimes a bill with a high price tag will get um, held in suspense in the um, in a, the appropriations committee, and you might not even you know that the negotiations there aren't always transparent. They often happen behind the scenes, and so you won't. Antoinette's nodding, and you guys probably know this process more than we do, <laughs> since we focus more on budget than policy side. But so I think sometimes it's kind of a black box in terms of whether you know, why one bill moves through appropriations and, and another doesn't. Yeah. I appreciate you answering my questions and, you know, that gives me more insight and more things to look out for and more things to just be aware of, um, especially because we're going into appropriations, um, I believe in August 14th. So mm -hmm. um, it'll be, it'll be nice to have that insight while I'm watching the, the court, court hearing. Yeah. Thank you, Melanie, for your question. We'll be thinking of this bill and your loved one. Yeah, thank you so much, Melanie. That was a terrific question. And I think that's definitely one um, that Sarah can like provide you with a resource or like where you can learn more. Cause I know that they'll be talking about our bills including 1310 next week. So um, Sarah, did you wanna share a little bit? That's exactly what I was going to point to Antoinette is next week, this is something that we will be directly addressing. Um, you hit the nail on the head, Mel Melanie. We're heading into appropriations and are likely to be on the suspense file and not heard till the end of the month. But next week when we meet, we can go over what all those things mean. We can talk about everything that Laura and Kayla just told us and what that would mean for this bill specifically. Uh, so I encourage you to come next week and we'll go over all of the bills, but we'll spend a lot of time with this one in particular. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. And Jane, I see you had your hand raised for a bit. Um, I just uh, wanted to add something about the, the cuts to the public defenders. Um, now this may have been separate, but I know that back in March, back in sort of uh, winter, late spring, there was a lot of concern about the 50 million that was being cut um, from resentencing. And uh, although resentencing very often has to fall under the prosecutor, um, the public defenders felt that um, there was a big chunk, as I said, this 50 million that was supposed to help them as well um, uh, from the other side on the resentencing. And I don't know, I know that there was a pilot program um, giving uh, a certain amount of funding to 10 of perhaps the most progressive 
DAs um, in the state, one of whom happens to be in my county. Um, but um, I'm not sure how that 50 million, 50 million might be connected to the concerns about that there's only this 40 million that's now um, uh, in the budget for public defense statewide. You start breaking that down by all the counties we have. That's really not very much. Um, anyway, I don't know if that sheds any light on it, but uh, I do remember following that earlier in the year. We could check it, I'm sure. Thank you so much, Jane. I really appreciate that additional just like context and, and insight there. Um, checking to see, and I also see some links dropped into the chat. Um, thank you, Kayla. I'm not sure that that link reflects the newest information. I think it it, it just talks about the, the previous rounds of funding. Um, but just in case there's any helpful information in there, I thought I'd share it. Yeah, thank you. Laura, I see you are off mute. Were you going to chime in here or? No, I think I just forgot to put myself back oh. on. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, great, great questions from, from our community here. Wanting to just like also create space if folks have additional questions that you may want to drop into the chat or come off mute, particularly around the budget process or um, any current budget advocacy that you're working on alongside other advocates. Actually, you know what? I was just trying to do a little bit of background and I went back and looked at the governor's proposed budget in, in January and it did propose a $50 million reduction to the public pilot, to the, to the pilot program. Um, so, you know what, actually I would need to do more research because I'm not sure what it, what it was supposed to be before that because they might've set a different, a higher funding level last year. But we can certainly dig more into that. Yeah, thank you for like for starting that research like now while we're here. Really appreciate you um, doing your best to find the relevant information to help us out here. And Sherry, I see you also just raised your hand. Hi, Sherry. Hi. Um, this is probably a really silly question but i'm i'm not so totally clear maybe there's other people that aren't either but on the budget for cdcr that you're talking about is that budget for maintenance and care per prison or is it including the money used for the different bills we're trying to to get funded and and passed uh is it or is that separate is it two separate budgets we're talking about or is it all lumped together does that make sense <laughs> i think so let me oh. let me try to answer and see if it makes sense <laughs> but, oh, okay so my understanding is so we have the budget act which has these um various line items related to cdcr that i went over that was signed at the end of uh, June, and and that's you know representing funding that's going to CDCR. And then there's these policy bills, which are still moving through the legislature, and some of them do have price tags attached to them. And the question is, you know, will those be two separate budgets? Are we talking about you know two different pots of money? And my understanding is is no, that it will have to be absorbed in in this year's budget or this upcoming fiscal year's uh, budget. So, so it's kind of like all in the same little pie wedge you were showing. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, this sort of parallel dance that happens this time of year between mm -hmm. the budget process and the policy bill process. And Kayla, I can pass to you to shed some more light on how that dance can sometimes go. Yeah, so I'm gonna 
dig up a resource that our research director, Scott, who's also our uh, the person we mentioned earlier that, that follows justice system stuff closely, he put together a great resource a few years ago about like how the budget bill and the policy bill process, you know, play out in parallel and how they connect, which I think is really helpful. Uh, and one thing that that's noted there is that, so if, for instance, if some of the bills that you all are watching do pass this year through the policy bill process, and they do require funding, um, but those policy bills don't don't include appropriations for them. But if they go through, they get passed, the governor signs them, then the governor would have to include uh, money in the budget for those to, to support those proposals in the next year's budget. Um, or potentially even a, re a revision to this year's budget if there was something it was if it was something that would would affect the current year budget. Um, so I hope that's helpful, and I will find that that link and drop it into the chat. Yeah, I, I think what I what what I was trying to figure out because it looked like it was like one big pie, is like if we get these important bills passed that cost the money, most do. Um, where does you know where do they take the money from? Um, are the guys going to get more dog food, basically? <laughs> you know, I mean, is the food going to get worse because there's no money for food because we pass these bills? I just, you know, I, I want to make sure that we are not hurting more than we're helping in cases, you know, some cases. Because I, I know they can, if they're going to make it balanced. They're going to make it balanced to the detriment of people that don't have a voice. What? That's an excellent point. <laughs> and... That's why, why my role is always about, we need to be finding revenues to support some of these programs. But I think also the work that you all are doing is to, to also find money in places where it's being used that where it, you know, take, paying for the things that we do want um, by moving money around um, in a way that's not gonna be detrimental. Um, but sometimes it's not gonna be transparent where the, you know, where the exact dollars are coming from, um, whether it comes from something else in the CDCR budget that, um, I think those are the good questions to be asking and that like, they're really implementation questions sometimes um, for like, for the agency. Um, Laura, you might have something to add, or I think Sarah, maybe we were trying to get in there. I was just going to briefly add that one thing that might be a helpful example. Well, first one thing to keep in mind is, um, a lot of our big bills, the cost to CDCR is only a small part of the cost, right? So we're looking at um, bills that do lots of different things, oftentimes around resentencing. And when we're looking at cost to the courts, that's not necessarily cost to the state agency. Definitely involved. There's, um, and we're constantly like, they're, they're talking about the play back and forth between the policy process and the budget process. Everything seems to touch everything. But for example, when we passed the Racial Justice Act, and then this year we came back and we successfully got $8 million in the state budget to implement the Racial Justice Act, that went to um, people, different agencies like uh, OSPD, so uh, the state uh, public defenders, and not necessarily to the CDCR to implement these things. So I would just add um, that one example to kind of keep in mind how it's not necessarily that it's all from that one chunk of pie. Um, lots of people have people have forks going in that one chunk of pie, but somehow there's like different slices of pie sometime coming in. Um, so it's definitely a great question. It can be kind of a confusing question also, but I would also encourage you as well, Sherry, to come to um, the policy meeting next week because these are great questions that all of us should be thinking about when we're thinking about our co-sponsored bills. What will this look like in implementation? Is there money in the budget for this already? Are we building on something that the governor has already said, yes, let's invest in this or let's find money from other places like Kayla was talking about. But I, so I just wanted to add the example of the RJA. And again, and a great question, Sherry. And thank you both for, for all of your insight. This is always so interesting. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate that additional insight. Um, Laura, Kayla, do you have anything else to add on that one? No, nothing else. Okay, I don't think I see any more hand raise, hands raised or 
any additional questions that have come through the chat. So I just want to extend another huge thank you um, to you, Laura, and you, Kayla, as well, and just in general to the California Budget and Policy Center um, for, uh, oh, actually, Sorry, finishing that. Thank you to the California Budget and Policy Center for the amazing work that you do and the partnerships that you cultivate with organizations like Initiate Justice. Um, but there is one additional question in the chat from Crispy, which is if you can share what is the total budget for CDCR this year? Do we have that number? I can pull it up pretty quickly. So if there's anything else that people want to ask or say, I can probably get to it real quick. Yeah, thank you so very much. Um, before we let Laura and Kayla get back to their evenings, was there any other quick questions that we wanted to add while Kayla pulls up that information? No, no other questions? Okay, um, so we'll just give it a moment. And thank you so much, Kayla, for using your like resources to, to get us answers promptly. Um, and also noting that Kayla dropped a document to the chat a couple of minutes ago um, on the budget and policy bill process. So a significant resource. I would encourage folks to pull that up and, and bookmark it. It looks like a really engaging slide deck. So it looks like for the enacted budget, um, I think this is the entire CDCR, CDCR. It's about 18.5 billion in state funds. Um, and then looking at all funds, so I think that just adds in federal, it's about 19.6 billion. And that's for the 23-24 fiscal year. Sorry, one more time, Kayla, 18.5 billion in state funds. What was the other number? I just wanted to make sure I capture it in our notes. Um, um, and I also, I just dropped a, a, a quick link in. So it's 19.6 when you consider all funds. So it's, I think that just, it's adding in the very small amount of federal dollars that are, that are going towards CDCR. Federal dollars. Okay. Yeah. But it's mostly state dollars that are going, going to CDCR. Okay. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and also thank you for dropping that resource into the chat. Yes, Crispy, um, definitely closing prisons. I'm um, highly encourage people to stay engaged, especially with um, the California Budget and Policy Center, organizations like Californians United for a Responsible Budget, also known as CURB, um, who are making great strides in ensuring that California does have a budget that is truly reflective of our values. Um, and once again, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Kayla. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Laura and Kayla, hope to see you again in other spaces. Before we, um, before we just completely close out, just wanted to remind people about some of our upcoming like meetings and things. As Sarah mentioned just a moment ago, you can join our policy team to get additional insight as to where our bills are, what to expect, um, what we're looking at heading into the, well, the suspense file hearing, appropriations, in other words. Um, and that meeting is going to be on next Wednesday, August 9th at 5.30 p.m. I believe one of my colleagues is going to drop the link in the chat to RSVP for that Zoom link. And then a couple of weeks later on August 23rd, I hope I have my date right, sorry. A couple of weeks later um, on Wednesday, August 23rd at the same time at 5.30 p.m., you can join our statewide advocacy manager for our community action committee. Highly encourage people to register, engage with us in that way. And also keep in mind that we meet here together collectively every first Wednesday of the month. Our next meeting will be Wednesday, September 6th at 6.30 p.m. You can register for that meeting at tinyurl.com slash ijmeeting. And every month you can register for our meeting at that tiny URL there. 
Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. If there's any additional questions for myself or my colleagues, um, please drop them in the chat. Otherwise, I other yeah. Otherwise, I hope everyone has a wonderful night. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. <laughs>